This episode of Unqualified Opinions is brought to you by HireChain. Your next hire could come from anywhere, a recruiter, a job board, a referral network, or a conference. HireChain manages hundreds of candidate sources for you, so you only see relevant applications and can focus on picking the best person for your team. On average, our customers fill open roles faster and 30% cheaper than with traditional recruiters. Leading companies like The Graph and Masari already use HireChain. So get your time back. Talk to HireChain today and hire the best, fast. Visit HireChain.io slash Masari for prioritized onboarding. This podcast is meant for informational purposes only and is not meant to serve as investment advice. Hosts and guests may hold cryptocurrencies discussed in this episode. Opinions expressed may not reflect the opinions of Masari. At one point or another, I can almost guarantee that we have had one of the two following shared experiences. First, you've had an overused sound from social media stuck in your head. We're dinks. We go to Trader Joe's and workout classes on the weekends. And second, you've tried a new social media app. But why? Who really needs a new social media app? Social media apps are driven by interactions. How you interact with the content, how you interact with creators or other users. There are a lot of reasons social media apps take off, but one factor is that they often give users a new way to interact with content that they haven't had before. Originally, Snapchat's one-time view feature gave users a new type of relationship with photos. TikTok's collaborative tools like Stitching took the idea of replying or commenting to a whole new level. It's that flexibility of format that drives new types of content, new relationships, and new ways of interacting. The trouble is, traditional social media companies at a certain point have a limited incentive to change their format and therefore their ways of interacting. Every change to their suite of interactions risks a change in user engagement, Every change to their algorithm risks a change in performance for their largest ad customers. And so at a certain point, they make the prudent business decision to follow more than lead. This is where the Web3 version of social media, Socialfy, comes in. The idea behind Socialfy, oversimplified, is that if you securely open source the building blocks of these social apps, profiles, connections, posts, data processing, then you can continuously unlock new ways of how users can interact with content, with creators, and with the apps themselves. And because that foundation is open and shared, switching between or to new formats becomes significantly easier. Two key product launches this month brought Socialfy back into the limelight, and their early progress has shown a light on exactly what types of new interactions might drive our new relationships with social media. Looking for a man in finance, trust fund, 6'5, five, five. I'm Tel Batista, and here's the story. Masari's annual conference mainnet returns this fall, September 30th through October 2nd. Now in its fourth year, Mainnet is the largest annual crypto event in New York, featuring leaders from crypto, Wall Street, and Washington. Join 3,000 attendees this year to hear from leaders like Kathy Wood, Hester Purse, and Chris Dixon talk about what's in store for this year, 2025, and beyond. We'll cover the explosion of real-world assets on-chain, the industry's physical infrastructure, the codependent relationship of crypto and AI, the continued growth of smart contract platforms, acceleration of institutional products, We've got it all. May net your opportunity to meet hundreds of projects shaping the future of crypto and the institutional investors and capital allocators helping to fuel their development. You can enjoy a 20% discount using discount code MASARIPOD when registering at mainnet.events. Interested in a prominent presence at this year's Mainnet? Snag a meeting room or a booth and contact events at masari.io to explore all Mainnet has to offer. Hey, Toe, how's it going? Hey, Ryan, how are you? I want to talk about Socialify because obviously there's been a lot of discussion around TikTok and its ongoing existence in the US. X or Twitter seems to evolve every day. And on the Web3 side, Farcaster again is posting daily active user highs. 
Our colleague Destin Tiander put out a great report on Masari Pro last week that summarized some of these latest developments. And you also follow this space closely. So I thought it would be helpful to hear from you, given all of this noise. Yeah, there has been. And specifically, if I can just dive in, there are two real differences between social fi and traditional social media that explain why I'm interested. Those two things are, number one, new ways for creators to make money, and number two, a new technical base on which these social apps are built. Yeah, take a minute to walk through those for those who haven't been following this as closely. The first is the different ways these apps and the creators on them make money. There's an important distinction that in traditional social, the mode is not tied directly to monetization. Facebook makes money from their ads, not their direct mode of a social network. On the flip side, SocialFi creates a mechanism where the moat is the monetization. One example is giving users the ability to buy a tradable token that's attached to a creator's profile or work. So just to illustrate what that is, imagine you saw, I don't know, the first dude perfect video ever and loved it. In this hypothetical social fire world, you could have bought the dude perfect token and benefited from being an early adopter of dude perfect. Maybe that token acts as a ticket to special dude perfect events. Maybe it lets you vote on what you want their next trick shot to be. But if they continue to grow, you benefit from being an early adopter. Throughout that time, you own that token, which it means at any point you could also sell it to someone else. And at least in many of the social Vi apps we've seen so far, the dude perfect guys would take a small percentage each time their token is bought and sold. And so does the platform. In previous iterations of social Vi, we've seen tokenization strictly on the content level, like songs and NFTs. And now we're witnessing this next evolution of tokenizing creators as a whole. This is obviously different from how traditional social media works and also changes the math for content creators. On traditional apps, creators only make money once they reach a certain scale, which is only reached by well under 10% of creators. So at first, early creators are taking on the burden of risk, both in money spent to produce their content and opportunity cost, what else they could be doing instead of being a creator. But on social fi apps, because they take a small percentage of that transaction every time their token is bought and sold, that monetization can start happening much earlier in a creator's lifetime, and creators can start earning with a much smaller audience size. That has some pretty major implications about what kind of content can be successful on these platforms. Right. Creators today, if they want to be among the highest earners, their content for the most part has to be mass market because they're getting paid primarily by ads. What we're seeing now in SocialFi allows for better monetization, especially for niche content creators. Now, it doesn't totally change the game for them. By and large, mass market creators will still out-earn niche creators, but it does flatten that power law curve a bit. Okay, what's the second piece? The second piece that interests me is the breakdown of the technical infrastructure that these apps run on. We call this the social graph. In traditional social media, when you sign up, your account profile stays with that platform, your follower selections stay with that platform, your posts stay with that platform. And when a new app comes along, generally speaking, you have to rebuild that foundation on that app. There's a handful of projects working on a blockchain-based social graph that you may have heard of, Farcaster, Lens, and CyberConnect. And what they're doing is building that technical infrastructure that will allow you to own your own profile including your follower lists, posts, et cetera, as a standalone item. Farcaster then, for example, will store this information for you, provide app developers with instructions on how to use it and tools to help them do so easily. And then app developers will come along and build user front ends using Farcaster as a base. There are a bunch of benefits to this, but one is that this could allow creators to have a much more direct relationship with their audience. Which, just to pull out for a second and explain why this is important, is the whole reason why cable TV replaced broadcast TV, why streaming TV replaced cable TV, why digital media replaced newspapers, all to get just a slightly more direct relationship with the end audience. This is just another step in that process. There's an important element of these two pieces, the monetization piece and the infrastructure piece, that I 
need to call out. And that is that they're both innovations to the underlying business model of social media apps and creators. There are plenty of innovations in social media that turn out to be flashes in the pan because they didn't actually change any of the underlying economics. But historically, if an innovation changes or improves the underlying business model of industry, like these do, that's generally speaking an indicator of something that will bring lasting change rather than just a fad. In this case, unlocking synergy between social applications, moats, and monetization is something that we haven't seen in Web2. And this flywheel is far more self-reinforcing than traditional social and goes to show the possible impact of these social fly business models. In your intro, you mentioned a few product releases that have demonstrated some of these new models already. Yeah, Friendtech launched their initial platform in summer 2023 with the innovation that you could attach a key to your profile. And your friends could buy that key, which would give them access to a creator's restricted group chat. The platform took a 5% fee of any purchase of that key, and the creator took a 5% fee also of any time that key was purchased, their own key was purchased. What's interesting is that using some very back of the napkin math and some optimistic assumptions, admittedly, based on just a few months of data, the platform's earnings during that first wave would equate to $100 million on an annualized basis. For context, that's in range with what we think Patreon made in 2022. Their financials are private, and so that's just the generally accepted best guess. Friendtech V2 just got released a couple of weeks ago, and their new features include a token for the platform itself called Friend, a group chat room function tied to key prices, and a decentralized exchange for those keys. Fantasy Top launched earlier this month as an app where you can build a fantasy team of content creators, similar to how you would in fantasy football. Creators score points based on how well their content performs, and Fantasy Top users compete their teams against each other to win prizes. Creators earn each time their account is added to a person's team or traded to another team. And what's interesting about this is that it doesn't require the creators to like post on Fancy Top or another app. Their posts on existing Web2 apps like Twitter still count towards the competition. This is a key differentiator in social. Why the content is collaborative across platforms. Social graphs give creators the autonomy to leverage their aggregate online presence instead of being siloed in just one application at a time. So the logic is definitely here for a better business model to be built. But the reality is users aren't just going to switch platforms for ideological reasons, at least not at a winner-take-all type scale. So what's it going to take for that to happen? Well, there's really two questions there. The first is, what's going to cause them to switch? And the answer to that is simply the content needs to be engaging enough, driven by either a new format, like TikTok most recently, or high-end creators reserving their content for that platform or something like that. And the second question is, what needs to be in place at the moment people want to switch? The answer to that is a seamless transition experience where all of the blockchain-related technical requirements are abstracted away, where the experience feels like any other Web2 sign-up process. Forecaster has executed really well on this and frames are that latest innovation allowing third-party actions directly on its social layer, such as buying ticket events or merch in one click in an app, creates a unified experience where all your consumer actions can occur in one application. When you break apart the tech stack and allow new apps to build on top of it, you dramatically lower the friction for new users to, to try new apps and amplify the use cases for consumers and creators alike. And generally speaking, this leads to a bunch of good things. More competition between apps, allowing users to vote with their eyeballs, more transparency around how groups are making their money and how a person's data is being used. As gradually over time, a greater portion of people's work, social relationships, and identities exist online. And when you take into account the growth of AI-generated content, this increased transparency and flexibility and competition will only become more and more meaningful. So, thanks. This episode was written and produced by Steve Bickemer based on a report called Social Fi, Exploring Social Business Model Innovation, written by Dustin Tiender for Masari Pro in May 2024. 
To read more about Farcaster, Friendtech, and what these business model changes mean for the valuations of social media apps, please consider subscribing to Masari Pro at masari.io.